Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 25. Matthew 1, 1 through 25. So my friend David had his ID stolen the other day. Now we just call him Dave. Ah, <laughs> yeah, now it's landing. It's coming in. Like, there's it's a slow coming in for a landing there. <laughs> well, to be frank, I'd have to get a new ID. <laughs> you got to think this early in the morning, don't you? Whenever I'm sad, I just read my blood donor ID. It always says, be positive. <laughs> so the theme in all three of those, what, good, I thought they were good jokes. The theme is ID, right? And that's what Matthew is doing with Jesus in this first chapter. Is essentially, he's giving you the ID. He's, he's showing that Jesus is who he says he is. And so that's, uh, you know, pretty bad segue, but that's what Matthew's doing here today is he's presenting the credentials of Jesus Christ, the long-awaited Messiah. The main point of today's message is Jesus is qualified to be the Messiah as the son of David, the son of Abraham, born of a virgin. He came to save his people from their sins. Now, you might say, so what? I've got all kinds of things going in life and, um, you know, I've got work issues and marriage issues and family issues and stuff like that. Man has a problem and his problem is sin and Jesus is the answer for that. And so what Matthew's doing here in the first chapter is he's proving that Jesus is qualified to take away the sins of the world. And so it is a big deal. You might say, I, I want to come to church for something practical. Trust me, there's nothing more practical than understanding who Jesus is. Because Jesus is the remedy for your biggest problem, right? So that's where we're going today. Last week, you remember, uh, we kind of set the stage for the Gospel of Matthew. We did an introduction. Uh, we focused most of our time on Matthew's purpose for writing. And if you remember, Matthew's purpose of writing was to present Jesus as the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. You remember how many places we went through in the Old Testament and pointed out all these different predictions of Christ, that he would come and what he would do, that the government would be on his shoulders and that he would restore the oppressed and he would give sight to the blind. And so we talked about that's Matthew's main purpose for writing, is proving that the whole Old Testament is fulfilled in the coming of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you knew that here today, that, that Jesus, the whole Old Testament is about anticipating Jesus and then the New Testament starts with Jesus coming, then Jesus dying on the cross, Jesus being resurrected, Jesus going to heaven, and then the church being developed, and then the Bible ends with Jesus coming back. So that's the whole Bible in a nutshell. So that's Matthew's purpose for writing, is to prove that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament predictions and prophecies of the Messiah. Today's message is like a two-part outline, but you've seen the sub-points on the one that I handed to you. But it's pretty simple here. In chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 17, the genealogy of Jesus. And number 2, verses 18 through 25, the birth of Jesus. Now, maybe genealogies have been one of the reasons you didn't want to read the Bible. Has anybody ever struggled with those? You ever heard somebody say that that doesn't know too much about the Bible? They say, I can't read that Bible. It's always begat this and begat that and he begat this and he begat the other. Well, from our understanding here today in Mason City, Iowa in 2021, that doesn't seem like such a big deal. But if a guy came and he said, I am the Messiah that's been predicted for thousands of years. I'm the king of the Jews and I'm the savior of the world. It would be pretty important to say, well, let's see your credentials, you know, and that's what the genealogy is here. So I, you know, to a Jewish reader at this time or to a Christian at this time that this was written, you know, 50 AD-ish, this would be tremendously important. So we have to kind of look at it uh, like that. It's kind of like Ancestry.com in a way. You know, they're going to figure out, you know, is, who's Jesus, uh, you know, and his bloodline uh, and his genealogy here. So the genealogy of Jesus and then the birth of Jesus. So that's where we're going today. Verses 1 through 18, the genealogy of Jesus. Pick it up in verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, in his opening statement, Matthew declares his central theme and his central character, which is Jesus Christ. The opening statement 
captures the purpose of Matthew's writing. Again, that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Now, when he says son of David, now you might be familiar with David from the David and Goliath story. It's the same guy. Now, back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, God made a promise to David that a king would always sit on his throne, that somebody from his line legally, there would always be a king sitting on his throne for eternity. And um, this is known as the Davidic covenant. So God promised David that there would always be a king sitting on his throne. Now it says the son of Abraham. Notice that next there in your Bible. Going back even further than David, Matthew declares Jesus to be the son of Abraham. Now, before God promised David there would be a king on his throne forever, he promised Abraham that someone from his seed, like in other words, from his bloodline, would be the Messiah, that all the nations of the world will be blessed in him. If you remember, that's in Genesis 12. It says, um, I will bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. And he says, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's God talking to Abraham. He's predicting the coming of the Messiah. Now, that's known as the Abrahamic covenant for you, uh, you know, theology nerd people. So what Matthew does here, right in the first verse, if you'll notice, is he connects Jesus to David and Abraham. Now, that'd be important because if the Messiah came, he's like, well, hey, I'm the Messiah. All the Jews would know at this time, if you are the Messiah, you have to be rightly related to David and Abraham. So that's why Matthew, in the very first verse, he says, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's where he's going with this, okay? And so, Let me see your ID. Let me see some ID, Jesus, right? Okay. Now, Verses 2 through 16, we're going to see the genealogy of Jesus through Joseph. But first, I want you to look at verse 17. So let's skip ahead. Now, some of you that like to go verse by verse linearly, you're freaking out. And you're like, we can't skip to 17 and then come back. We can do it. It's going to be okay. You'll be able to handle it. Read verse 17 there. It says, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations, and from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. So what he does in verse 17 is he makes a summary statement of what he says in verses 2 through 16. He comes at the end of this genealogy, and then he gives a summary statement about it, right? And that summary is divided into three parts. Matthew's genealogy is divided into three parts. Abraham to David which is a thousand year period, David to the captivity in Babylon, which is a 400 year period, then the captivity in Babylon to the Christ, which is another 600. So you see right there, it's a 2000 year period he covers in that genealogy, right? Trying to help you guys with this because, you know, the begats and all this stuff, we always you want to breeze over this stuff, but we're kind of taking it apart piece by piece and helping your mind to wrap around like what's being said in there. So Matthew, he separates it into three categories. Now, when you read the Old Testament, what you realize is he left some names out, right? Obviously, this isn't enough, um, you know, these aren't enough names right here to cover a 2,000-year period, right? Now, Jewish reckoning, as one scholar said, didn't require that every name uh, be in a genealogy to satisfy, uh, you know, it, it had the purpose of just proving Jesus connects all the way back to David and to Abraham, right? So why 14? Why, why does he separate into three groups of 14? Well, I thought this was kind of interesting. I ran into this in my reading. Uh, the name David in Hebrew, uh, numerology, it adds up to 14. And I don't know if you knew much about this. Uh, in Hebrew language, letters were ascribed a certain number. And the word David is actually just the consonants. It's DVD. And so uh, D is a four. Uh, it's Dalit in Hebrew. Uh, Vav, six. And then Dalit again, which you add that up and that's 14. So a lot of scholars think the reason Matthew separated these into three 14 year or 14 generation sections is because of that and just to aid with memorization. So, you know, you could take that for what it's worth. I think it's pretty interesting. The most important thing to understand about this genealogy is that Jesus is qualified, he legally has the right to be the Messiah. He is the fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham and David. 
The genealogy establishes Jesus' claim to the throne of David through his adoptive father, Joseph. Now, this is not the blood lineage that you read in the Gospel of Luke through Mary. Sometimes people will say, man, that Bible contradicts itself. In Luke, it has one genealogy, but in Matthew, it has another. Well, scholars widely agree, and it's obvious by reading it, that in Matthew, you're looking at the legal lineage through Joseph, and in Luke, you're looking at the bloodline through Mary. Now, let's get into the genealogy. And when I go through these names, if I mess them up, I mean, please don't laugh at me, (laughs) because some of them are like, how do you, you know, how do you pronounce these things? I'll do my best, okay? Here we go. Verse 2. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brothers, Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar, Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashon, Nashon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. So he takes you right there from Abraham all the way to David the king. Look at those two first names there, Abraham begot Isaac. Pretty interesting, right? Do you remember the promises made to Abraham? God promised Abraham that he would have a son. From his own body, the son would come. And through that son, Isaac, the whole world would be blessed. And you remember what happened with Abraham? You guys remember the story? Abraham probably got a little impatient. And so his wife, Sarah, uh, he said, hey, um, you know, Sarah said, um, go ahead, Abraham, and go into my maidservant and have you know, a son with her, because we're not obviously having kids. They were really old by that time. They were like, you know, in their hundreds. Um, And um, so Abraham, he has relations with this gal named Hagar, which is Sarah's maid servant, and they have a son named Ishmael, right? And then later on, God comes and talks to him, and he says, Abraham says, have Ishmael. He'll be the one for the promise. And God says, no, you're going to have a son from your own bloodline. And, you know, you remember it's a miracle. He ends up having a son when he's like, I mean, I don't know, he's like a hundred and some years old. He's beyond the age of having kids, right? Just to kind of picture the whole situation is kind of like, what? It was miraculous. And it was based on a promise that God made. And that promise had to be received through faith. And so we see that in the genealogy of Jesus, the first two names testify to the fact that God's doing things based on promise and faith. I think that's pretty interesting. If you don't know too much about Old Testament history, Matthew gives you a good launching point to go back and to start reading these stories and to find out, you know, the context of what's going on. Notice the word begot there. It goes through the whole genealogy, the word begot, except for in verse 16. Notice that there in verse 16. What does it say instead of begot? Anybody? Is this thing on? Good morning. <laughs> Does anybody notice the word there? Instead of begot? Born. born, right. The first time that begot isn't used in the whole genealogy, the word born pops in there. That's very significant. And we'll talk about that when we get there. All right. Okay. Now he says in verse 2 there, look at Isaac begot Jacob. The line of the Messiah came through Jacob. Now, if you remember that story, came through Jacob instead of Esau. Now, Esau was the older one. So convention said, should have said that Esau got the blessing. The Messiah should have came through Esau. But again, this points to God doing things in an unconventional way. The blessing came through Jacob. Now, it also shows God's grace and mercy too, right? Because do you guys remember Jacob? Does anybody know what Jacob's name means? Anybody know? Aaron knows. That's my wife, by the way. (laughs) Heel catcher. Right? Uh, and it was, a, it was a term back then. We don't know. We don't use that term much now. But essentially, it means con man. Right? He was like a manipulator. And so, it's pretty interesting that God chose to bring Jesus Christ through the line of Jacob and not his brother Esau. Right? Jacob tricked his brother Esau out of his blessing. Remember how he did that? He disguised himself. He goes into his dad. He puts on uh, fur on his arm so he feels all hairy like Esau. And his dad's old and he's about to die and he's going to pronounce a blessing on his son. And he goes and he pretends to be Esau. And he's feeling him. He goes, oh, your arms are hairy. You must be Esau. And he starts to pray for him. Remember what Esau means, by the way? Hairy. (laughs) You know, you can't beat that name, right? Uh, 
It, it just points to God's grace and mercy that Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, he's coming through this bloodline that's based on faith and promise and forgiveness and something that's not conventional, right? Pretty interesting. Moving on, verse 2, Jacob begat Judah and his brothers. Now, Jesus being from the line of Judah is the fulfillment of prophecy. And we talked about that a little bit last time. You know, when you get to the end of the Bible where it says in Revelation 5.5, 5, it says, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seals. That's a heavy scene in the book of Revelation in chapter 5. But essentially... Um, they call Jesus, John, you know, is, he's calling Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so it's significant that in the genealogy here, uh, Matthew's pointing that out, that Jacob begat Judah. Why? Because Jesus is the lion of Judah, right? Now, verse 3, Judah begat Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Now, this is really interesting. In Jewish genealogies, they didn't put female names in them, ever. And Tamar here is a female name. So that again points to the fact that God breaks down walls between people, barriers. In the line of Jesus Christ, you have children of promise. You have the heel catchers in there, the manipulators in there. And now you have him putting females into the genealogy. This is proving, uh, this is saying something about God. That when a Jew, an Orthodox Jew would read this, they'd be like, Wow, this is really challenging for, for me to read this. They didn't, the Jews at that time didn't think much of women, um, unfortunately. Jesus Christ elevated, um, you know, Jesus Christ was essentially the first one to, to declare the worth of women in these cultures uh, at this time. It's unfortunate uh, the way that they were, but Jesus was the, the one that came and, and said everybody's equal and, and there's no male or female or Jew or Gentile or black or white or anything. Now, it's also interesting about this gal Tamar here. Do you guys appreciate this? This is the line of Jesus Christ. Now, within the line of Jesus Christ, this gal Tamar shows up in here. Now, who knows anything about Tamar? Right. Okay. Two of you. Good. All right. That's better than none of you. Now, Tamar in the Bible well, she was involved in um, a pretty scandalous situation. If you want to read about it, it's in Genesis chapter 38. And what Tamar did was she kind of got the short end of the stick with some husbands that she'd had. And she essentially wasn't having kids. And so what she did was she came up with this scheme to have kids. And the way that she did this was she went and disguised herself as a prostitute and she went and slept with her father-in-law. And uh, she ended up having, you know, some kids and actually, you know, through her children, through her offspring, the line of Jesus Christ continued. Now, wrap your mind around that for a second, that Jesus Christ in his lineage, we find here a woman of questionable virtue, Right? What does that tell you about God? See, when I was outside of God, I used to think, man, the church, that's where all those good people are and they want nothing to do with me. I'm a bad person. I can't be good enough to be involved with all that stuff. But even in his lineage, Jesus Christ is trying to communicate to you that he's the one that's good, that humans aren't, and that he associates himself with the lowly, with the troubled, with the sinful, even in his genealogy. That should be pretty... Um, life-giving to you here today. It was life-giving to me because, you know, I grew up in questionable lifestyle. You know, I used to spend time uh, doing things that, um, you know, were obviously dishonoring to God and for a number of years. And so when I learned that God was the God of grace and mercy and forgiveness and restoration, that was really encouraging for me. I knew that I was welcome in his church, you know. That's really life-giving to me. I like what Charles Spurgeon says about Tamar being introduced here. He says, Observe the dash of unclean blood which enters the stream through Judah's incest with Tamar. O oh Lord, thou art the sinner's friend. Now, verse 5, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Now, Rahab, interestingly enough, not an Israelite. She's a Canaanite woman, and she was also known as a prostitute. When you read in Joshua chapter 1, 
You read what Rahab did for a living. She was a prostitute. She's in the line of Jesus as well. She was saved by her faith. Um, you remember when the destruction of Jericho, God spared Rahab and her family because of her faith and, and what she did uh, to uh, you know, protect the messengers of God while they were in uh, Jericho. So there again, more in Jesus Christ's lineage proving that he's the God of grace and mercy. Now, when you get to uh, verse 6 there, it says, uh, And Jesse begot David the king. So that's David from David and Goliath, and he took you from Abraham to David. Thousand-year period fulfilled right there. Now, second part of verse 6 through 11, from David to the captivity in Babylon. This is a 400-year period. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam. Rehoboam begot Abijah. Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begot Joram. And Joram begot Uzziah. And Uzziah begot Jotham. Jotham begot Ahaz. And Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh. Manasseh begot Ammon. Ammon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time that they were carried away into Babylon. All right. If you have anybody's looking for baby names, this is a good section right here. <laughs> David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Now, are you familiar with what happened here? I find it interesting that Matthew doesn't mention her name, but rather alludes to the incident that her and David were involved in, right? You remember this woman mentioned in the genealogy here. She's known as Bathsheba. Uh, David and Bathsheba had an illicit affair, which resulted in the death of her husband, Uriah. And also, they had a son together, and it resulted in his death uh, as well. But after repentance and restoration, then their son, Solomon, was born. Again, a testament to God's grace and mercy to the undeserving. Now, Solomon... When you're looking, when you're comparing uh, Luke's genealogy and, G- and uh, Matthew's genealogy, at Solomon is where Mary's and Joseph's line splits. David has a, ca- a son named Solomon, and it goes one way. It goes this way through Joseph. And then David also has a son named Nathan, and it splits the other way, and that comes to Mary. And you notice that when you lay both the genealogies next to each other and compare them. And that's significant, and I'm going to tell you why in a minute here. Now, verses 7 through 11, um, within that list there, there were some good and some, also some incredibly wicked kings, Hezekiah to Manasseh. Uh, it's a vivid reminder that, you know, man is all over the place, right? You have some good and you have some bad. Uh, Manasseh, in fact, was known for his terrible wickedness, but it's interesting. He's in the line of Jesus Christ. Manasseh was terribly violent and cruel, uh, but he's in the line of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine Jesus sitting down at Ancestry.com with Matthew and all the disciples and they're looking and, and he's, whoa, Manasseh. <laughs> wow. You know, that's kind of the idea. When they would read this, they'd be like, wow. Josiah begot, verse 11, Jeconiah and his brothers about the time that they were carried to Babylon. Now, that time where they're carried away to Babylon, that's one of the most significant events in the Old Testament. So if you're trying to get a handle on the Bible and how the whole timeline fits together, locate that time in the Bible and, and start to make a mental picture in your mind. When you read the book of Psalms, some of the Psalms were before they went into captivity and some of the Psalms are after they went, came out of captivity. It's important to know where this captivity in Babylon fits in the whole biblical timeline. We won't talk about it here. But <clears throat> Now this word, this name Jeconiah here. So this is pretty interesting. You're going to have to think through this one. Jeconiah in verse 11. This is interesting because in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 30, there's a verse there that says essentially that Jeconiah and all of his line is disqualified permanently from being a king. This is interesting. His bloodline, no one could ever be a king from Jeconiah's bloodline. You say, well, how in the world can he be in the line of Jesus Christ then? Right? Jeremiah 22.30 says this, Thus says the Lord, Write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. 
Now, this is significant because there's a problem here. If this curse is on Jeconiah and Jeconiah is in the line of Jesus, then wait a minute, Jesus isn't qualified to be the Messiah. You guys tracking with me here? If Jesus would have been the blood relative of Joseph, he would not have been qualified to be the Messiah according to the Jewish history. You see that? God is drawing attention to the fact that Jesus is adopted by Joseph, born of Mary. See that? It's interesting that God is drawing attention to the virgin birth, even in the genealogy. And so when you see that name Jeconiah, you think, well, in Jeremiah, it said Jeconiah was cursed. You know, he's cursed from the throne. Can't ever happen. If Jesus was a blood relative of Jeconiah, he'd be disqualified. God is drawing attention to the miraculous nature of the Christ. Jesus' bloodline going back through Mary avoids the curse of Jeconiah because after the split from David, Solomon, and Nathan, you see Jesus avoids it right there because it goes uh, Solomon, then it goes down to Jeconiah, but it goes from Solomon to Nathan, then to Mary. So he can be the blood relative of Mary, but not of Joseph, you see? Say, wow, this is taking a lot of thinking here. I didn't know this was going to happen this morning. Hey, <laughs> got to think through these things. The Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your what? Mind. With your mind, right? So it honors God to think through these things, right? Now, it's interesting how he did this. He draws attention to the miraculous conception. Jesus could not have been a blood relative of Joseph or he would have been disqualified from becoming a king. Verses 12 through 16, from the captivity in Babylon to the Christ, 600 years Verse 12, and after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel begot Abiud, Abiud begot Eliakim, Eliakim begot Azor, Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim, Achim begot Eliud, Eliud begot Eliezer, Eliezer begot Matthan, Matthan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now, after Zerubbabel, most of those names have just fallen off into obscurity. We don't really know who they are, which is interesting because by the time it gets to Matt, then begot Jacob, begot Jacob begot Joseph. Those are nobodies. And in fact, Joseph's really poor. You know, he's a poor, lowly nobody. And I think that's also interesting that Jesus Christ came in through the line of poor nobodies. So again, I feel comfortable being in church, you know, don't you? Don't you feel at home and welcome with Jesus that he chose to come in at a lowly estate? Remember that song we were singing, God came low to us? That's what we're talking about. He condescended to come to man. See, there's, there's nobody that's disqualified from coming to Christ, right? And he's trying to prove that even through his genealogy. Notice there where it says, Joseph, um, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, who was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. He is taking careful pains to make sure that he doesn't say that Jesus was born of Joseph, right? If you notice that there, the English translation actually has it pretty well. But I'm going to give you some technical commentary from the Greek commentators I read right here. The word whom in that uh, verse 16 there. Notice where it says, of whom? What the Greek scholars tell us, the Bible was written in Greek, so I read Greek commentary on the original text. I don't know how to, I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't ever want to pretend like that. But I can read their commentaries, okay? And what he says is where it says, of whom there? This is a feminine relative singular pronoun, okay? In the Greek language, their words also have genders, male, female, and neutral, I can't tell you the intricacies of it, but I can tell you that they have those in the, and past tense, present tense, aorist tense, all these different tenses. And so what he's telling us there, as it's a feminine relative singular pronoun, is that of whom refers to Mary and it cannot refer to anybody else. So what Matthew is saying here is Jesus was born of Mary, not of Joseph. And he's taking careful pains in the Greek to state it the way that he does, to say that Jesus is born of Mary, but not Joseph. So that is the genealogy right there. If you were a Jew at this time, 
when Matthew is writing with your arms folded and your eyes squinted and saying, you say Jesus is the Messiah. Well, is he the son of David? Is he the son of Abraham? Yes, he is. In fact, let me show you. And that's what he just did. And he also, within there, was careful to say that he wasn't born of Joseph. He was born of Mary. So those are the two things you want to take away from that section. Moving on. Verse 17, we already read that. Um, he summarizes. So these are the generations from Abraham to David, right? Now, moving on further, verses 18 through 25, now we're going to see the birth of Jesus. So we see through his human legal line how he's qualified to be the Messiah. Now we're going to see that he is divine. Verses 18 through 25. Verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now, Luke gives a more detailed account of Jesus' birth than Matthew does. Matthew essentially is giving you Joseph's perspective. Let me say this. If what you know about the birth of Christ has come from greeting cards and Christmas in America, most of it's wrong, honestly. You know, um, it's kind of interesting to read the Bible. I mean, I'll tell you what, I don't like Christmas tradition. I don't like it at all. I'm all about like tearing down the sacred cow of like the nativity scene. I really am. You know, the thoughts there and all that stuff, but it's not biblically accurate. And so I think at least as a representative of Christ, I should, you know, I, I want to be biblically accurate about what I do. And, you know, Hallmark makes a nice card and, you know, people buy, you know, and it's unfortunate because that's, you know, about... A lot of Christians, that's about the only time they think about Jesus is when they see him in the nativity scene. You know, 364 days a year, they kind of put him away. Maybe they come out at Easter too, but, and, you know, I think it's good to be uh, precise about our understanding of scriptures and to know what the Bible says for real, right? It's more important than tradition, All right? Now, verse 18, um, the virgin conceives, now, notice what it says there. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. When was the last time you used that word? Betrothed, right? If you're dating, I mean, you ever try to go out and betroth anybody? You know, like, hey, let's, should we betroth? <laughs> we, I think we did that when we were dating. We kind of had like a betrothal, sort of. I don't know. Does anybody know what betrothal is? When was the last time you, you know, nobody knows what it is? Well, so we need to understand what betrothal is to understand what's being said here, right? And to appreciate the gravity of the situation. <laughs> uh, marriages in these days were arranged. I guess we didn't have a betrothal. I, sorry. Okay. Marriages were arranged uh, for, <laughs> well, kind of. Her mom used to bring her to the church. So, you know, trying to set us up together, you know, so it's kind of arranged in a way, like, you know, her. Anyway, Okay. You say it's good to talk about yourself a little bit, let your heart out, and, you know, and people get to know the pastor. Okay. Betrothal. So, okay, start again. Marriages were arra arranged for individuals by their parents, and uh, contracts were actually negotiated between the parents. You could be betrothed from the time you were a young kid in Jewish, you know. It's kind of like today, like, I know some families that, that they see somebody that hangs out and they go, oh, that's my future son-in-law or something like that. It's kind of that same sort of thing where they actually, they actually could get them betrothed when they were kids in this day. Um, yeah. Uh, after this was accomplished, the individuals were considered married and were called husband and wife. So Joseph and Mary are in this stage, okay? They did not, however, begin to live together. Instead, the woman continued to live with her parents and the man with his for one year. The waiting period was to demonstrate the faithfulness of the pledge of purity given concerning the bride. If she was found to be with a child during this period, she was obviously not pure, but had been involved in an unfaithful sexual relationship. Therefore, the marriage could be legally annulled. If, however, the one-year waiting period demonstrated the purity of the bride, the husband would then go to the house of the bride's parents and in a grand procession march, lead his bride back to his home, they would begin to live together as husband and wife, and they would consummate their marriage physically. Matthew's story should be read with this background in mind. That's what it says in, in one of the commentators I was reading. 
So you'd get betrothed. You wouldn't live together. You'd demonstrate your purity. After that time was up, husband would come over with a grand procession, take the bride back to his house, and then uh, they'd live together from then on. It's kind of like that movie Before the Wrath that we watched here. We saw the visual display of that. Okay, so that's the background. Joseph and Mary are betrothed, and she's pregnant, right? And she's pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Now, guys, say that you're dating somebody, you're engaged to be married, and you're out to dinner at Prime and Wine for a date night on Thursday. They didn't pay me for that, by the way. That wasn't a... They, they could. They should. And you notice, you say, man, my wife is starting to show something. What the heck is going on? I'm engaged. And you, and you don't want to ask, are you, because guys, you know, and so you don't want to say, are you pregnant? You know, because she's like, no, I've been going to exercise group on Wednesdays. What do you mean? <laughs> but something is obviously wrong. And, and she orders a whole plate of pickles and nothing else. And you're like, what, what is going on here? And cheesecake. What? And you say, look, I, I can tell you, you're, you're with child. You're found with child. And she says, you know, and she doesn't say anything. This is a weird situation, right? Have you ever read the Bible, like kind of putting yourself into this, kind of picturing how weird this is? Like, this is bizarre, right? Now, Luke, when you read his account, an angel told Mary what was going to happen. Mary knows what's going on. Now, from this indicator here in, in Matthew, he doesn't tell, she doesn't tell Joseph, right? Now, she must not have told him because, I mean, who's going to believe that? Well, um, I want to tell you that I, it's, it's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, okay. You can get a ride, right? <laughs> Look what it says there. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now, before they came together, that's God's like classy way of saying before they had sexual intercourse, right? There's no mistaking what's being said here. And I want to point this out because the liberal theologians today, the liberal scholars, they have, have explained away the virgin birth. They say that didn't really happen. They explain away every miracle in the Bible, and they say, oh, that's not what the Bible says. And I'm pointing out that the Bible clearly says that, okay? They're in this one-year betrothal period before they had come together physically. Now, as I said, Luke tells us the account of Gabriel visiting Mary to announce the birth of Jesus in Luke 1, chapter, 20, or chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. Now, she maybe had told Joseph about this, maybe not. We don't see here. But if anything, it must have seemed far-fetched to Joseph, right? I mean, gosh, I don't know if I would believe that. Now, most obviously, if she's pregnant during her betrothal period, she'd either been unfaithful or perhaps violated, which is very common also. If she'd been violated, why not tell Joseph? And if she'd cheated on Joseph, why would you add to it by, uh, you know, coming up with this disgraceful lie, well, this is God inside of me, you know, like, hmm. So he must have been perplexed, to say the least. Joseph no doubt loved Mary dearly. This would have been incredibly troubling. Now, a quiet divorce is desired, verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband... Being a just man and not wanting, to put, or not wanting to make her a public example was minded to put her away secretly. Interesting that Joseph is described as a just man here. When we think of the term just, we think of somebody that follows the law to the T and they want justice. But Joseph is described as a just man here and the description of that is that he wants to put her away quietly. Is, do you appreciate that? It's interesting. You think of somebody wanting justice. Well, I want justice. I want everybody to know that this is wrong, that this lady slept with somebody else. And, and this is such a serious thing because Deuteronomy chapter 22, who knows what the penalty was for sleeping with somebody outside of marriage in those days? Does anybody know? Stoned to death, right. Do you know how many people would be having affairs today if that was still going on, by the way? If God was still doing that, do you wonder how, many, how people would treat marriage? I think it's absolutely disgraceful how, how America as a whole treats marriage, right? Disgraceful, right? Imagine if we valued marriage like God values marriage, right? 
So, but Joseph, being a just man, wants to put her away quietly. Justice here is described as compassionate and merciful. And I think that's really interesting for you to grab a hold of today. If you're questioning, uh, you know, is God harsh? Because God is just, but yet he's loving. I can't wrap my mind around it. Well, look at Joseph here. Joseph, being a just man, didn't want to see this gal get stoned to death. Another thing that Joseph would have done if he's like a lot of men is he would have been so upset and so, uh, you know, hurt by the whole thing that he would have just wanted to see her get punished, right? That's how a lot of dudes would be, right? Well, she did that to me. What the heck with her, man? Stone her, you know? This takes a lot of character to love somebody so much that even when you think that they did something terrible against you, you still seek their best interest, right? That's a character trait. There are some people always looking to expose everybody else's faults. It's all they talk about is other people's faults. Joseph wasn't that kind of guy. He was minded to put her away secretly. Verse 20 through 21, an angel convinces Joseph not to divorce. But verse 20, while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you, marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." Interesting that an angel of the Lord intervenes. And as you read through the book of Matthew, there are five dreams where the Lord speaks to people through dreams to keep the whole prophetic picture on track, right? If Joseph would have been, you know, it would have screwed up the whole prophecy. So God intervenes through a dream supernaturally and convinces Joseph not to divorce his wife. Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take to you marry your wife. Imagine the relief that this would have been. He no doubt felt betrayed, but God tells him he does not need to fear. It's interesting to think about through this whole time how Mary's faith would have been challenged. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being Mary, an angel comes to you, your, your gal's here, you're pregnant, and God tells you, you're pregnant with the Messiah. And all of these people in the culture around you think that you're just like, scandalous, that you've been cheating, that all this other stuff's going on, and everybody's talking about you, and they have bad stuff to say about you, but you just walk by faith humbly through the whole thing. Her, her faith must have been really challenged through all of this, I could imagine. You know, it's kind of like that in the kingdom, you know, as a Christian. When God's going to kind of do a big work, a lot of times testing comes, right? And that happened to her. But Joseph is assured by the word of God, which is where the greatest assurance comes from. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. No real indicator of how this happened here. Luke 1.35 says the angel, the angel says that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and overshadow you. One commentator says the how is something we ought not to pry into. And I think that's probably good advice. And you shall call his name Jesus. Now, Jesus was a very common name at that time. The significance is in the meaning. The meaning of Jesus means the salvation of Yahweh or Yahweh's salvation. That's what the name Jesus uh, means. And it says here his mission, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, the angel gives a beautifully succinct description of the purpose of Jesus coming. I want you to notice also in that statement there where it says that he will save his people from their sins. It doesn't say that he will come and show people how to save themselves from their sins. It doesn't say that Jesus will come give you a 10-step program to where if you get that well enough, you know, if you do it right, then you're going to earn your way into blessing and favor with God. It says that he comes to save you. That implies that you're needy and that you need to be saved, right? This is the mission of Jesus is essentially to, you know, dig us out of a pit that we can't get ourselves out of. No. That's the biggest problem that we have. Our sin separates us from God. But Jesus came to save us from our sins. Verse 22 through 23, the virgin birth fulfills prophecy. Verse 22, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. 
This is one of Matthew's key statements, that it might be fulfilled. And what he's saying is the birth of Jesus is fulfilling a prophecy of the Old Testament. And then he quotes Isaiah chapter 7. <clears throat> now, scholars that want to do with the miraculous nature of Jesus' birth, they look at that verse Matthew quotes from Isaiah, and they say the word virgin in the Hebrew is the word alma, and now that could be translated young woman. So they say, this isn't a virgin miraculous birth. It just means young woman. So this verse Matthew quotes from Isaiah, they say, in Isaiah, that word just means young maiden. Now, to think through this too. I know there's a lot of thinkers in this message here today. Has anybody ever heard stuff like that? You ever watch like the History Channel versions of you know, Christianity shows and they always talk about how none of the miraculous stuff's really real or accurate or, or that he wasn't really born of a virgin or anything like that? This, these are kind of the arguments against the Bible. I guess if you get out of like white Midwest Bible Belt sort of place, you start running into more skepticism. You know, it's out there in the world. It's in the universities. When your kids go to college, they're going to run into this sort of stuff. And they'll say... It wasn't a virgin birth, it was a young maiden, because the word in Isaiah, translated virgin, is Alma, and that could also be translated as young woman. Well, that is true in Isaiah, that it could be translated young woman. But Matthew quotes the Septuagint. Now, the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament done about 2nd century before Christ, and it was done by Jewish scholars. And what they did was they took the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures and they translated them into Greek. Does anybody know why they did that? Teacher's pet. Ah, betrothal. <laughs> the reason they did it was because the Hellenization of the whole known world at that time. In other words, Alexander the Great, he started forcing everybody to speak Greek. So you had all these Jews growing up speaking Greek not being able to read their Old Testament. And so these 70 Jewish scholars, that's what Sept 7, Septuagint, 70 Jewish scholars translated the Old Testament into Greek so the Jews could read their Old Testament. Now, it is interesting that Jews want to deny the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ. So you would think it would be really telling of what did the 70 Jewish scholars think of that word in Isaiah? How did they translate that word into Greek? You guys tracking? Okay. They translated that word into the Greek word parthenos. Parthenos can only mean virgin, a woman that has not had sexual intercourse. Okay? So, Yes, it is true in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 4, that the word Alma can be translated young maiden. But when they translated the Old Testament into Greek, they took the word Alma, Hebrew, and they replaced it with Parthenos, Greek, which only means virgin. Matthew's choice of the word Parthenos means that he is saying, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus was conceived of a virgin, a woman that had not had sexual intercourse. It's miraculous. No, that's extremely important. That doctrine has been held by all the church fathers throughout the history of Christ. There are a few essentials that if, you're, if you don't hold to these things, you're not a Christian. The virgin birth is one of the virgin conception is one of them. Um, and there's a handful of others, the Trinity, so on. Now, they shall call his name Emmanuel. This is confusing to some people because they say, well, they called him Jesus. Nobody ever called him Emmanuel anywhere. That verse, it's helpful to get an understanding of that, to look at the context of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 7, it says you'll call his name Emmanuel. But in Isaiah chapter 9, he's called Wonderful. He's called Mighty Counselor. He's called Everlasting Father. And he's called all these things which are titles. So it's good to look at Emmanuel as a title for Jesus, right? And that title is exactly what it says there. God with us. You should call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. And people will say Jesus, you know, especially our, our Muslim neighbors, they'll say Jesus doesn't claim to be God. The Bible doesn't say Jesus is God. This is one of the many places where the Bible calls Jesus God. It says he's God with us, right? How is God with us? He's 
with us in prayer. He's with us in the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's with us in the Word and the Word being taught. Where two or more are gathered, He's there in a special way, the Bible says. You know, as a pastor, that's probably the... People have come to me for, for counsel here and again. And probably the greatest counsel I've ever given anybody um, is that for you to focus on the fact that God is with you. And if you're here struggling with something today and you have doubt and uncertainty about your life and you're having difficulty of any kind, if you start to meditate on the fact that God is with you in those things, like that changes your perspective, that God is always with you. If you have a problem with fear today and you practice the presence of God, realize that he's with you, that puts fear in its proper place. You're, you're worried about how you're going to pay your bills. You're worried about how like, things are going to work out. How, who's going to take care of me? Well, God has promised to do those things. So if I focus on God, it puts those stresses in the proper place. If I have a problem with holiness and I'm not really too concerned with you know, living a Christ-like life, well, to practice the presence of God really fixes that, doesn't it? Because you're like, you know, next time that you're in an argument with your wife or something and you're not saying the things that are edifying and godly and you stop and you go, wait a minute, God's with me right now. God was with me in the car on the way here when I was yelling at my kids or whatever it is, you know. Uh, God's with me when I'm watching uh, stuff on the computer that I maybe shouldn't be or whatever it is, you know. Practicing the presence of God is a good thing and it's probably the best counsel I've ever given anybody. Um, as a pastor. Verse 24 and 25. Joseph and Mary are married. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took to him his wife. And he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. No. He was obedient to God in this weird situation. <laughs> now I think that's an exhortation to somebody here today. You're in a weird situation. You need to be obedient to God, even though it doesn't make sense to you, right? You need to be obedient to God even when things don't make sense. They don't have to make sense to you. It makes sense to him. And what's important that you're obedient to him, right? Now, so he, against all convention, he has Mary move in. And uh, notice verse 25, and he did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son. He said, well, he knew her. Well, this is the Bible's classy way of saying that he did not sleep with her. He did not have sexual intercourse with her until after Jesus was born. I also want to point this out if you've ever had any experience with Catholic doctrine where they teach the perpetual virginity of Mary. That does not, that's contradictory to what's being said here because the Bible says that Jesus had other brothers um, and right here it's saying that Joseph did have sexual relations with Mary after Jesus was born. And so the Catholic teaching of uh, the perpetual virginity of Mary, that's not a biblical doctrine, that's a man-made doctrine, that's tradition that they've uh, brought in um, which is not found in the Bible. In fact, contradicts, it's, it contradicts the Bible. So wanted to point that out while we were here. You should call his name Jesus. They were obedient and they called his name Jesus, which would become the name above all other names, the name that if you confess, God will save you, the name that you run to for salvation. So in conclusion, you can see Jesus is uh, legally qualified to be the Messiah through the line of his adopted father, Joseph. He is also divine as illuminated by the account of his birth. Some things you cannot deny about the intentions of this text is that Jesus is not the blood son of Joseph and he is of divine nature. You can't get away from those two things reading this text. Matthew's clearly proven that Jesus is qualified to be the Messiah. Two concluding thoughts here. Number one, God doesn't always do things the way you think he's going to do it, right? Right? Now, if you were going to bring in the Messiah, you know, how would you do it? You know, I wouldn't have done it like this. You know, I would have had like a big, you know, big party, you know, and some speakers and DJs and everything. Like, it'd be like a big thing, you know, like a, you know, and billboards. Here he is. But God doesn't always do things like the way you think he's going to. And maybe that's encouraging for you today because you keep asking God to do things the way that you think he should. 
And so then you're discouraged by God. You're discouraged about the whole Christianity thing because God doesn't do things the way you think he should. Well, guess what? He doesn't always do things the way you think he should. You just need to be open to the way that he wants to do things and be humble and submitted to him. Now, next thought. From the very beginning of the gospel, Matthew shows us that God is a God of grace, mercy, forgiveness, and restoration. And I hope that that ministers to your soul here today. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, God, that it's true all the time. And we thank you for Matthew's great work to take great pains to show us that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he's qualified to be the Messiah. And God, thank you that you sent your son to save us from our sins. And so, Lord, we love you. I pray, Father, for anybody here today that hasn't opened their heart to you to receive the forgiveness of sins. Father, that your spirit now would move upon them. Let them know, Lord, that your invitation is there, that if they'll confess your name, that if they'll trust in you for salvation, that you will save them from their sins. And Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are the Emmanuel Jesus, that you are God with us. And we pray in your name. Amen.